Okay, hi everyone. All right, we will uh, get started now. So um, my name is Rebecca Bornstein. I'm a student in the M3D program uh, here in the Department of Pathology. And today I have the great pleasure of introducing our PATH Presents speaker, uh, Dr. Ming Wong from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Wong's research explores the role of metabolism and longevity and healthy aging. She is investigating a connection between lipolysis, retrograde signaling, and lifespan extension in C. elegans. She is also researching the role of the microbiome and biome and longevity, and has developed some really interesting optogenetic techniques in C. elegans to do so. Um, she has received many accolades for her scientific contributions, including the NIH Director's Pioneer Award and the Early Career Life Scientist Award from the American Society for Cell Biology. In 2018, she was named a Howard Hughes investigator, and in 2019, she was elected as an American Association for the Advancement of Science Fellow. For today's seminar, she will discuss the effects of lysosome to nucleus signaling on lifespan and, micro and bacteria host metabolic interactions, which promotes, promote host longevity. The chat function should be active. So feel free to type in questions during the lecture and I will read them at the very end. And then also at the end of the seminar, you may turn on your mic and ask questions yourself if you prefer. So even though it's a bit difficult to do so on Zoom, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wong. Thank you, uh, Rebecca, for the in invitation, also for the very kind introduction. I always feel a big honor, you know, when I'm invited by students. And uh, thank you for, you know, an excellent summary of our research. Actually, we should ask you your version to you know, revise our website. I think it's really highlights uh, our research and thank you. So, um, yeah, so, you know, it's really unfortunate I cannot meet everyone uh, in person at Seattle is my favorite city. Uh, but I think this Zoom format is also great. I think it's offer us opportunity to keep connected and then you know, have this opportunity uh, to share with you some of our uh, recent work. So as uh, Rebecca introduced, like my lab, very interested in metabolism and longevity. So, you know, as we um, currently stand, um, aging is still an uh, inevitability. So looking at these two self-portraits of Picasso, uh, we can see after 65 years, the artist got more wrinkles on his face and also uh, lost hairs. But aging is not simply changing how we look outside. Uh, intrinsically, um, it's associated with decreased fitness at the whole body level. So age associated changes in different organs um, can lead to functional declines and diseases, including physical impairment, uh, metabolic uh, symptoms, and uh, neuron degeneration at a more. So as a result, you know, if we look at senior people over 65 years old and compare to the uh, younger population, uh, the prevalence of most chronic conditions increased dramatically as shown in this chart, uh, such as Alzheimer's, uh, cardiovascular disorders, and cancer. So treating all those age onset diseases is generating a huge burden to public health. And with current pandemic, um, the public health is also concerning the more fatal effect of COVID-19 on our senior residents. So aging is really making all of us more vulnerable to different diseases. But same time, we also saw those happy news in this pandemic. So it's really amazing those centenarians are not only long lived, but um, age gracefully and stay strong. So that, you know, always intrigued the question, you know, what could be the uh, underlying uh, secret of longevity and a healthy aging? So many of us in the field, I think, enter the field because we are motivated um, by this question and this myth. 
and uh, we are trying different way to decipher uh, this secret and uh, you know to understand uh, what is behind and hopefully you know by understanding it uh, then we can apply this to everyone and to improve healthy aging and longevity and to fight against age related diseases so in my group, we work at the interface between metabolism and longevity. And we are particularly interested in the signaling role of metabolite. So as we know, um, those are the molecules that are generated um, from various chemical reactions um, in the cell. So you know, they come from all those metabolic uh, activities that are happening constantly um, in each cells. So, you know, they, their production are directly connected uh, with a variety of different cellular activities. And importantly, as a chemical code of the cells, um, they are also highly conserved across different species from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. And in eukaryotic cells, uh, metabolite production is further compartmentalized into different cellular organelles. So each type of organelles carry their own specific collection of metabolite. And the production of those metabolite are tightly linked to the function of those organelles. At the same time, um, for bacterial cells that share the same environment, with the host organisms. They're also constantly generating and releasing different metabolite to influence the physiology of the uh, eukaryotic organisms. So in our studies, we are really interested in those metabolite. So we hope to understand how specific metabolite can actively regulate signal transduction and then mediate the communication between different organelles within a cell and then between different cells and tissues uh, at, in an organism and even between uh, different microbes and their host uh, eukaryotic organisms in the same ecosystem. So we aim to pinpoint those specific uh, metabolite and then um, to understand how they are regulatory mechanisms operate using synorabidiasis elegance as a model system. So C. elegance is a free living nematode is about the size of comma. So, you know, at the 20 degree, if you know, we follow a group of uh, C. elegans through their life, then about 50% of them will be dead around um, day 17 and 18. So their mean lifespan is about two and a half weeks. So with this short lifespan, it makes these systems very powerful um, to understand the molecular regulation of aging and longevity. So using this system, we have been try to understand the interaction between uh, longevity and the metabolism and then focus on the role of signaling metabolite. So along this line today, I would like to share with you um, two ongoing research areas in the lab. So the first part, uh, I will show you how we find lysosomal metabolism um, can generate signals to regulate organelle crosstalk uh, and uh, organism longevity. And second part, uh, I will show you how we find uh, bacterial metabolism um, can signal to host mitochondria and then their longevity uh, regul uh, regulatory mechanisms. So first let's focus on lysosomes. So these are um, highly specialized organelles uh, in eukaryotic cells. So they constitute this acidic environment, uh, act downstream of endocytosis and phagocytosis to digest the materials taken up from the environment. And at the same time, they also interact with autophagy and responsible uh, for degradation and recycling of unwanted cellular component. And for those functions, uh, lysosomes carry a variety of uh, hydrolases in the lumen and also on the membrane. And their activities are tightly connected with the metabolite production from lysosomes. So through our studies, 
we find actually those hydrolases are not only inert digestion tools, but they also actively participate into lysosomal signaling um, to mediate organelle crosstalk and tissue communication. And today I would like to share with you uh, two examples. So one uh, is a lysosomal acid lipase uh, that regulate the production of lipid signals. So um, this project uh, started uh, with a warm lipase called lipo 4 So I identified this lipase when I was a postdoc with Gary Rafkin. And then and find it's a very interesting uh, genes because in wild type conditions, if you look at its expression, it's very, very low, barely detectable, but is dramatically upregulated upon fasting and also in several different um, longevity animal models. So then um, when I started my own lab, uh, my first uh, graduate student, and she's an MD PhD student, Andrew Follick, now um, doing his uh, uh, fellow at UCSF, work on this lipase and then uh, find out this lipase actually carry a lysosomal acid lipase activity. And he also find when you constitutionally express this lipase selectively in fat storage cells of C. elegans, animals live longer as shown here. So you can see their lifespan is extended. And importantly, this longevity effect uh, is evolutionarily conserved. So here, Andy made two transgenic strains to overexpress um, two uh, homologs of lipo 4 in fur flies. And so he, again, selectively expressed them only in fat body, the faster tissues of fur flies. And find in both cases, the, um, fa the fly that overexpresses those lipase lives longer compared to the controls. Then, you know, the question is how does this lysosomal lipase regulate longevity systematically? So through understanding this regulation, Andy um, delineate this lysosomes to nuclear retrograde lipid messenger signaling pathway. So what he find is when this lipase is induced in the lysosome, it will promote the translocation of LBPA protein from the lysosomes to the nucleus. So LBP8 encodes a fatty acid binding protein. So you can consider it as a lipid chaperone. So you can bind and transport lipid signals to different places. And in this case, it transfers the lipid signals to the nucleus and then activate a specific nuclear hormone receptor complex, NHR49 and NHR80 to promote longevity. And Andy also find a specific lipid metabolite involved in this uh, lysosomal signaling called oleoacinolamide, OEA. So it's a lipoamine lipid. And then he find it's induced upon the induction of lipo 4 in the lysosomes. And through biochemical analysis, he also find OEA can directly bind to the chaperone protein, LBP8, and also to the nuclear receptor, NHR80. And importantly, overexpression of this chaperone protein, LBP8, um, can prolong lifespan. And same, uh, similarly, if supply the OEA, the lipid metabolite to wild type animals, also prolong lifespan. So suggesting um, this natural lipid metabolite is sufficient to recapitulate the benefit that we saw in transgenic strains you know, with either LBPA overexpression or lipo 4 overexpression. Now the question we have is then where is OEA coming from? So is OEA really coming from the lysosome? So to un uh, answer this question, a former postdoc Yong Yu, who now started his own lab, uh, developed a protocol for rapid uh, isolation of lysosomes from C. elegans with the help from David Subtini's group at MIT. Then using purified lysosomes, we profile different class of a lipid. And uh, excitingly, we can clearly detect OEA in purified lysosomes. And its level is increased more than twofold in uh, lysosomes purified from lipo 4 transgenic strains. So now we know OEA can be generated at the lysosome but how is generated there? 
So we don't know um, the answer yet, um, but recently through lysosome specific pro proteomic um, profiling analysis, uh, graduate student Max Gao find very interestingly, there are proteins that are specifically enriched uh, in the lysosomes purified from the lipotransgenic strains. And there, there are several um, enzymes um, that's involved in lipid metabolism. So he suspects that some of them might be responsible for the lysosome production of OEA. So now he's uh, conducting uh, more genetic and biochemical analysis to confirm. So hopefully, you know, we can delineate this metabolic pathway soon uh, at lysosome specific manner. Then at the same time, we also want to know how this lipid chaperone protein, the nuclear enrichment uh, is actively regulated. So to this end, uh, current graduate student, John Duffy collaborated with Eric Otland's group at Emory University and obtained the LBPA structure at 1.3 Armstrong. Then from the structure analysis, we identified three residues that are potentially important for nuclear uh, translocation of fatty acid binding proteins. As you can see, those three residues are highly conserved in several mammalian FABPs. Um, but to our surprise, um, when John mutated these three residues to alanine and then made the transgenic strains to test their importance in vivo, we found actually the mutant form of LBPA can still enrich in the nucleus. So suggesting these three residues are not critical. So then, you know, it suggests maybe there are different um, uh, new mechanisms that regulate um, the nuclear um, translocation of this group of fatty acid binding proteins. Uh, so now uh, John is conducting biochemical uh, IP mass spec and also genetic screens uh, try to understand uh, the possible mechanism involved. So together, um, these studies shows that um, indeed there is a signaling crosstalk between the lysosomes and the nucleus. Um, then the next question we want to know then, you know, does this lysosomal signaling can regulate other organelles activities? So a former uh, MD PhD student, Persona Ramachandra and a current graduate student, Mazia Samini is interested in this question. And in particular, the activity of mitochondria because um, through transcriptional analysis, and they find the genes that involved in mitochondrial beta oxidation are increased in the lipotransgenic strains. So this include ACS2 uh, encoding SO-CoA synthetase and ACDH1 encoding ISO-CoA dehydrogenase. So both enzymes are required um, for mitochondrial beta oxidation. Then to directly assess whether mitochondrial beta oxidation is affected or not, they measured the oxygen consumption rate and uh, um, exam its changes uh, with and without mitochondrial beta oxidation inhibitor. And they find with mitochondrial beta oxidation inhibitor, the oxygen consumption rate is reduced to a greater extent in the lipo for transgenic strains. So suggesting the mitochondrial beta oxidation is increased. At the same time, if you look at the basal metabolic rate, um, the two are very similar. So this shows us that this long-lived transgenic strains my preferentially utilize lipid instead of sugar for energy production. And consistent with this idea, when they measure the fat storage levels in C. elegans, and they find the fat storage is decreased in the lipo 4 transgenic strains. And this reduction can be rescued um, by knocking down ECS2 using RNAi to suppress the induction of mitochondrial beta oxidation. Then the question is whether this catabolic switch towards lipolysis is important for the longevity regulation. So to answer this question, um, Persona and Mazia first uh, knocked down ACS2 selectively during adulthood and find its inactivation can suppress the lifespan extension in the transgenic strains without affecting white type lifespan. And conversely, when they overexpress ACS2 selectively in fast storage cells of C. elegans, 
um, to increase mitochondrial blood oxidation and more live longer. So this shows that increased mitochondrial blood oxidation is both required and sufficient for the longevity regulation. Then this shows that there is a very interesting connection between lysosomal signaling and uh, mitochondrial beta oxidation activities. Then how about other mitochondrial activities? So first through biochemical analysis, they find that the, act, the ability of uh, electron transport chain complex two to transfer electron is decreased in the lipo four transgenic strains. And this reduction uh, is also depend on increased mitochondrial beta oxidation because when they knock down ACS2 by RNAi, the reduction got fully rescued. And conversely, when they increase mitochondrial beta oxidation by overexpressing ACS2, the activity of ETC complex 2 is decreased. And uh, importantly, um, genetically, um, when they knock down the ETC complex 2, um, the lipo 4 transgenic strains can no longer prolong lifespan. So together they show that this lysosomal signaling first regulate mitochondrial blood oxidation activities and then consequently affect ETC uh, complex 2 activities to regulate longevity. At the same time, through cellular analysis, uh, they also find that metal ROS production is increased uh, in the lipo 4 transgenic strains, as shown here using metal SOX staining. And this induction can be suppressed by knocking down ACS2 using RNAi, uh, suggesting mitochondrial beta oxidation uh, is also required for this induction. And interestingly, you know, although these animals have increased ROS production from mitochondria, they are better protected uh, from oxidative stress like you know, pyroquat treatment. So how this is working? So to answer this question, um, persona have screened a group of uh, transcription factors and find JU1, which is a redox sensitive transcription factor is required for the longevity effect caused by uh, lipo 4 transgenes. So suggesting this transcription factor might be activated in lipo 4 transgenic strains likely by metal ROS signals. And furthermore, they also find that, you know, the antioxidant genes are upregulated in the lipo 4 transgenic strains in a June one dependent manner. So that may explain why the animals are better protected um, against oxidative damages. And then this um, induction also depend on increased mitochondrial beta oxidation because when you knock down ACS2 by RNAi, the induction uh, completely gone. So together, this shows that um, this lysosomal signaling can trigger a catabolic switch from uh, glycolysis towards lipolysis. Then as a result of this catabolic switch, uh, the metal ROS mediated retrograde signaling um, can uh, activate antioxidant gene expression in the nucleus uh, to um, increase uh, the redox homeostasis and also promote longevity. So there is a, a crosstalk among lysosomes and mitochondria and the nucleus. So this crosstalk really help to improve the metabolic and redox homeostasis and then promote longevity. So this is a one example to show how lysosome metabolism can actively regulate organelle crosstalk to promote longevity. The next example I would like to share with you uh, is about a previous unknown lysosome hydrolysis that target our nucleotide signals. Uh, so this is a collaboration with J. Wang's group at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. And the project started um, by a former graduate student, Louis Mack, and it's now continued um, by a new postdoc, Qian Zhao, in the lab. So in these studies, uh, we're uh, interested in uh, enzymes that regulate uh, uh, production of a signaling nucleotide called guanosine tantrapentaphosphatase, PPGPP. So this is a single nucleotide 
widely exist uh, in bacteria and it play very crucial role in growth controls and stress responses and exert its actions at multiple levels by affecting DNA replication, uh, RNA transcription and translation. And in bacteria and plant, PPGVP can be synthesized from GTP or GTP and then hydrolyzed back. And then its synthesis and the hydrolysis is catalyzed by the same enzyme that have both the hydrolase domain and the synthetase domain. But if you look at the metasome homolog, it has only the hydrolase domain left. Then when we started this project, its solar functions in metasome remain unknown. So Lewis worked on a C. elegant homolog and named it RSH1. So he decided to first look at the subsolocalization of RSH1. And then before he did start the experiment, we all of us actually expect to find RSH1 at mitochondria, given its bacteria origin and also its chloroplast localization in plant. But to our surprise, uh, RSH1 does not localize at the mitochondria. So here, RSH1 is visualized by its R fusion. And so you can see there's no overlap with mitochondrial localized GIP. Instead, we found RSH1 RP overlap with two different lysosomal markers. So one is LAMP1 GIP. So LAMP1 is a lysosomal membrane protein and also lysotriker. Then the question for us is then what is RSH1 doing at lysosomes? And then, you know, as a geneticist, the way to answer this question is, okay, let's mutate it and see what happened um, to the animal. So we did that and Louis have um, done a serious phenotypic analysis. And from this studies, and he find interestingly, the RSH1 mutant, the loss function mutant uh, is more resistant to toxin that induce ER stress, including uh, tunicomycin and DTT. So this is quite interesting to us because first we know bacteria do not have ER. So we think this regulation might be specific to the metasome homolog. And secondly, today, uh, the mechanistic uh, link between lysosomal metabolism and ER protein homeostasis remain poorly understood. So we think by understanding uh, the role of RSH1 in regulating ER stress response, we may get some new ideas. So then to understand how uh, lysosomal RSH1 regulate ER stress response, uh, Lewis have screened uh, around 150 genes uh, that encode um, lysosomal proteins. And from this screen, he identified three VHA genes and their inactivation uh, decreased ER stress uh, tolerance in Y type conditions but more importantly, fully suppress the ER stress tolerance in the RSH1 mutant. So here I show you uh, VHA17 as example. So you can see here. So we know VHA3 and 17 encode the integral domain of lysosomal VATPases. So, it's, so that's responsible for pump the proton into the lumen and then so to maintain the acidic pH. And then this, um, VATPase is also had a cytosolic domain and the VHA11 encode a, a, sub, a, a sub unit that connect the integral domain and then the cytosolic domain. But interestingly from the same screen, Lewis also find VH8. So that encode the cytosolic domain. So if you look at its inactivation, you will see it, like the HA17, its inactivation decreases um, the ER stress tolerance in white type condition. But unlike the HA17, it does not affect the ER stress tolerance in the RH1 mutant at all. So together, this tells us that this lysosomal VATPase is important for RSH1 to regulate ER protein homeostasis, but this regulation might not related to its roles in regulating pH. So we know in recent years, lysosomal VATPase has become well known for its activity in regulating mTOR C1 activation at the lysosomes. So it's cooperate with regulator complex and the RAC GTPase. 
And then the lysosome activation of, of mTOR-C1 can uh, regulate multiple downstream effectors, uh, including uh, S6 kinase and also TFAP transcription factor. So to test whether mTOR signal is involved in the RSH1 regulation, Lewis first inactivate both REC GTPases in C elegans, so REC A and REC C, and find their inactivation fully suppress the ER stress tolerance uh, in the RSH1 mutant. He also inactivate the downstream effector um, R6, uh, S6 kinase in C elegans uh, is called RSKS1. So you can see its inactivation also fully suppress the ER stress tolerance in the RS1, RSH1 mutant. So together showing that mTOR activation might be increased in this mutant. And then supporting this idea, Lewis confirmed that the active phosphorylation of RSKS1 is increased in the RSH1 mutant. Um, so as shown in the, uh, as a, using the Western. And more strikingly, uh, through transcriptal analysis, we identified 560 genes that are differentially regulated between Y-type and the RSH1 loss function mutant. And among them, only two, only two that are independent of RSKS1. So it's really sure that S6 kinase is a master regulator downstream of RSH1. So together now uh, we know at the cellular levels, RSH1 is localized at the lysosomes and its loss will activate uh, mTOR signaling uh, to induce transcriptional responses and enhance ER protein homeostasis. But what factors mediate those transcriptional responses? So to answer this question, uh, we conducted bioinformatic analysis of CHIP-C data of various um, transcription factors and nuclear hormoreceptors. So basically we are searching for factors, um, ways uh, in which the binding on RSKS1 dependent um, target that are differentially regulated in the uh, RSH1 mutant. I hope I didn't um, lose you here. Um, but basically through this analysis, uh, we find uh, H H HLH30, the thialigan homologue of a TFAB that a well-known target regulated um, by mTOR um, shows no enrichment. Instead, we find two nuclear hormone receptors, NHR23 and NHR25 uh, is highly enriched on those target. And interestingly, there is a large overlap between NHR23 and NHR25 on those target. So suggesting maybe these two transcription factors, uh, these two nuclear hormone receptors coordinate in this regulation. And more importantly, we find inactivation of either NHR23 or NHR25 fully suppress the ER stress tolerance in the RSH1 mutant. So together it shows that this nuclear uh, hormone receptor complex, um, we think so, um, acts downstream of mTOR signaling um, to regulate ER protein homeostasis. But how S6 kinase uh, regulate NHR23 or NHR25, we still don't know. So we are now doing more uh, genetic and biochemical analysis um, to figure out. Uh, but at the same time, we also want to know, so in the RSH1 mutant condition, you know, whether um, nucleotide metabolism is altered. And if yes, how this alteration contribute um, to the regulation of ER protein homeostasis. So to answer this question, we have screened a group of enzymes that are uh, involved in nucleotide metabolism. And from this screen, we identified three uh, enzymes that involved in, AD, in NADPH biosynthesis. So two of them encode NAD kinase, so basically catalyze the NADPH formation from NADH, and one encode the uh, enzymes, the rate limiting enzymes upstream. 
So as you can see here, inactivation of either of them can fully suppress the ER stress tolerance in the RSH1 mutant. So this tell us that RSH1 might regulate NADPH metabolism. And interestingly, when we look at the chemical structure of PPGPP and NADPH, and we found actually both nucleotides carry a phosphorylated ribose module, as you can see here. So in PPGPP, this phosphatate can be removed by uh, bacteria and the plant RSH1. Then we wondered, can RSH1 remove this phosphatate from NADPH and convert it, it into NADPH? So we first examined the NADPH and NADH levels using air chromatography coupled with mass spec and find in the RSH1 mutant, the NADPH levels is increased um, around 25 fold, but the NADH level is not affected, suggesting it may regulate NADPH biosynthesis uh, um, uh, dephosphorylation. Uh, but to directly assess the phosphatase activity of RSH1 towards NADPH, we purify lysosomes uh, from C. elegans and then uh, test its ability to dephosphorylate NADPH. And we find when using lysosomes purified um, from Y type, uh, they're very effective to dephosphorylate NADPH, but this activity is dramatically decreased when using lysosomes purified uh, from the RSH1 mutant. So suggesting the, um, the loss of RSH1 um, is, right, is affecting uh, the lysosomal NADPH uh, metabolism. So, um, so when it's missing, the NADPH got accumulated there and that uh, in Increase the increase in ER protein homeostasis by acting uh, act mTOR signaling. But the question is how how ER protein homeostasis, uh, homeostasis is increased here. So from the um, transcriptome analysis, uh, we find the genes called XBP1, which is a key component involved in ER unfolded protein response, is increased in the RSH1 mutant. So XBP1 is a very interesting uh, protein. So it's get activated um, by non-canonical splicing and nuclear translocation. So we find both the unspliced and active splice form of XBP1 are increased in the RSH1 mutant. But this induction is completely gone when inactivating RSKS1 to S6K kinase at the same time. And then importantly, uh, inactivation of XBP1 uh, fully suppress the ER stress tolerance in the RSH1 mutant. And suggesting XBP1 is one of the contributors to the ER, uh, to the improved ER protein homeostasis. And then uh, we also find a group of genes that um, called FKB. So they encode the enzymes that catalyze a cis to trans esmerization of proline peptide bound. Uh, so we can see they are all increased in the RSH1 mutant in a RSKS1 dependent manner. So we know those enzymes are very important for proper po protein folding in ER. So consistent with this function, you can see inactivation of FKB3 fully suppress the ER stress tolerance um, in the RSH1 mutant. So together, it shows that you know, this RSH1 mTOR signaling um, kind of in, in, induce uh, a specific transcriptional responses in the nucleus and prime the organism for better resolving ER stress when encountering them. Then after identify this signaling, next we want to know then whether this signaling contribute um, to aging or uh, longevity. So to test this question, you know, first we look at the lifespan. So actually this is a surprise to us because it's well known that reduction of mTOR increased lifespan in a variety of different organisms from yeast all the way uh, to, to mice. But 
we find although the RS1 mutant have increased mTOR activation, they are not short-lived. Instead, um, actually those mutants uh, can increase the survival of the animals that have autopsy um, in their neurons. So this, we are using a um, ultimate disease model in C. elegans and find RS1 mutant protect the autopsy there. And also with the pathogenic infection, the mutant animals survive better. So we think then this lysosomal signaling, the RS2 immediate lysosomal signaling may not regulate uh, lifespan, but instead a health span. So it coupled the ER protein homeostasis uh, with neuron health and also innate immunity. So, but we want to do more uh, molecular characterization to um, fully um, uh, confirm that all the regular mechanism that we find that are responsible for the ER protein homeostasis regulation are also important for those healthy aging uh, regulation. But together, I hope you know these two uh, examples can uh, kind of show you um, the lysosomes are not just a uh, scavenger center of the cell. So the lysosome metabolism and signaling are really coupled. So their specific um, lysosomal metabolite can function as a signaling molecules to mediate organelle and tissue communication. So we think by better understanding the signaling role of lysosomes in those communications, we can um, find new mechanisms that will help us uh, to improve metabolic health and longevity. So in the uh, last couple of minutes, I will switch the gear and then talk about um, how bacteria and then host mitochondria communicate and how this communication contribute um, to longevity regulation in the host. So how did we become interested in bacteria and host mitochondria interaction? So in the past um, decades, um, there are many studies focused on the phylogenetic compositions of a bacterial community in the host. Uh, so, you know, leading to very exciting discoveries that associate a uh, specific bacterial species with host health, including longevity. But we asked this question uh, a little bit differently. So we wondered then what happened to different genes that express in same bacteria. So for example, uh, when you drink Pepsi versus Coke, the same bacteria inside your gut may turn on different gene expression and generate different metabolites. So we wondered how this bacteria genetic heterogeneity contribute um, to host longevity. So to answer this question at the systematic level, a former postdoc Bing Han, who now also started his own lab, um, collaborated with Christoph Herman at Baylor, so who is a bacteria geneticist. So we have screened the whole collection of E. coli knockout. So out of nearly 4,000 um, E. coli deletion, being identified 29 that can significantly prolong the lifespan of the whole C. elegans as shown here. So now he's in his own lab, I think he's trying to understand uh, each one, uh, how they are regulating host longevity. But when he was here, um, uh, in my group, um, from this list, he find two interesting candidates uh, called HNS and Long. So he find these two uh, bacterial factors both negatively regulate a transcription activator called RCSA in bacteria. So uh, RCSA uh, in bacteria control the biosynthesis of a clonic acid, which is a polysaccharide, is a polysugar um, synthesized in bacteria when they're stressed. And its biosynthesis require um, 19 enzymes that actually expressed in the same operon. And this operon is controlled um, by RCSA. So being found actually when you delete either HNS or lung, the CA production per, from bacteria is um, largely induced. And then also very important for the longevity effect. He also successfully developed a protocol to purify CA from culture medium from bacteria and confirm that purified CA can prolong lifespan of white type worms. And these animals are not just long-lived, so CA can also um, protect 
uh, worms against age-associated pathologies. So here um, being used two disease models. So one is a germline tumor model where the germ cell undergo uncontrolled proliferation. So eventually they migrate out from the germline into somatic tissues and kill animals at a young age. Another is Alzheimer models where the human toxic amyloid beta uh, is ectopically overexpressed in worms. Then with age due to their accumulation, animal also die at a young age. So in both cases, uh, being fine CA treatment can increase the survival of those animals. And he also confirmed that CA uh, is sufficient to prolong lifespan in white type fruit flies and also attenuate uh, age associated increase in gut uh, stem cell proliferation. So it's known in young um, worms, uh, sorry, young flies, um, those gut in, in uh, stem cell stay in a quiescent state, but with age due to gut inflammation, they become over proliferated. So uh, being fine CA treatment can uh, attenuate um, this age associated increase suggesting CA can protect the gut from age associated uh, inflammation. So like from the screen, also from the uh, mechanistic characterization that we are doing, uh, we think the bacteria genes expression and um, uh, metabolite production is very important uh, to regulate host longevity. Then the question is, how can we fine tune um, bacterial gene expression and metabolite production from live bacteria when they're reciting in the host gut? So um, to answer this question, um, we use CA as examples and collaborated with Jeff Tabor's group at RISE, who is a bacteria engineer, and to apply the optogenetic controls of bacteria um, in um, our system. So this project has been a collaborative effort um, between Lucas in Jeff Tabor's group and Montreal uh, in my group. So here we use this uh, light inducible uh, two component system. So in this system, the sensor protein is activated by green light, then phosphorylate the downstream responsive protein CCAR, then the activated um, CCR binds to its regular element and turn on downstream gene expression. But the whole uh, system can be switched off by using a uh, right light. So first using GIP as a reporter, we confirm this um, bacteria system can be easily and reversibly turned on and off inside the gut of live C. elegans. Then we use this system to drive RCSA uh, overexpression. So as I mentioned earlier, this transcription activator is required for clonic acid biosynthesis. So now we put its control under the light and then um, we find you know, with increasing power of a green light, the CA production indeed increase exponentially in this engineered string. We then, um, to use this strain for lifespan experiment, and we choose two dose of light intensity. So you can see in the high intensity, uh, the CA production uh, is reached to the level very similar to the lung mutant, and then in the low intensity is about half the dose. So we find now with uh, with this light inducible uh, strains, worm now first become lung lived with a green light, and secondly, there's a very nice dose dependent. Uh, effect. So the lung, the stronger the green light, the longer the worm live. So, but if we use a lung mutant, although the worm a long live, but you don't see this light sensitive phenomenon. So it's really proof the power um, of this optogenetic approach um, for fine tuning uh, bacterial gene expression and metabolite production in vivo. So it's really open a door to study the bacterial host interaction in a uh, time and then space control manner in a quantitative um, uh, con with a quantitative control. So now we are really um, pushing um, the further application uh, of this um, technique to a broader uh, aspect. 
But same time, we also want to know, you know how does CA exert its benefit on the host? So we did a series of genetic and uh, cellular studies to make a long story short, we found mitochondria as a target. So we find CA can regulate mitochondria fission fusion dynamics on folded protein response and also electron transport chain activities. So here show you one example, like how CA regulate mitochondria dynamics. So we use a mito GFP to visualize a mitochondria network in intestinal cells of young C. elegans. Um, so you can see we um, categorize them to tubular or intermediate or fragmented morphology and quantify um, their portions. And then we find CA treatment increase um, the mitochondrial fragmentation. And importantly, this increased mitochondrial fragmentation is important for the longevity regulation because when we knock down DRP1, which is required to drive mitochondrial fragmentation, uh, selectively the intestinal cells, we found the CA longevity effect is completely gone. Then, you know, how does CA regulate uh, mitochondria in the host? So we don't have the full story yet, but recent work from uh, Guo Hu, a current graduate student in the lab, find that uh, maybe the CA from bacteria can be taken up into host intestinal cells through endocytosis um, because um, she used REP5 and REP7, the two GTPs that required for early endosome and late, late endosome function. And she find when they are inactivated, the effect of a CA on mitochondrial dynamics is completely gone. And uh, similarly, if you knock them down selectively in intestinal cells, the longevity effect of CA is also gone. So it's showing that the bacteria derived CA may act through the endolysosomal system uh, to target our mitochondria and regulate longevity. But exactly how, uh, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. But uh, nevertheless, I think these studies reveal a very interesting um, chemical crosstalk between bacteria and the host mitochondria. You know, as a biologist, it's quite exciting because based on same biogenesis theory, we know they are Asian relatives. So it's very interesting that, you know, um, after so many years separation, you know, bacteria can still talk to their eukaryotic cousins using their secreted metabolite. But then the question for us is whether CA is a unique example for such communication, or we just review the tip of the iceberg. We think it's a letter because uh, um, through two other studies, we find other um, bacteria-derived metabolites uh, also communicate to mitochondria and regulate lipid metabolism. So now Meng Cho, the postdoc in the lab, is taking systematic approach uh, to uh, um, investigate on this communication. Hopefully we'll find more examples um, for uh, you know, such interesting communication. So I think that's all I would like to share with you today. I already mentioned uh, the people who are leading those um, project. You know, they are really uh, the, the main contributors to, to the project. But I want to also thank everyone in the lab. You know, it's really wonderful team uh, to work with. And also our um, collaborator who really bring their unique expertise and help us to move into new areas and um, uh, answer new questions. And also funding agencies who make uh, our studies possible. And then thanks Rebecca again for the invitation and this great opportunity um, to share with you some of our recent progress. Thank you so much for the wonderful seminar. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, so uh, feel free to type them into the chat or even just unmute yourself if you so desire. Hi, I have a question. Thank you, the talk was really great. Um, have you looked at mitochondrial morphology in the RSH1 mutant, just based on what's known a little bit about the Raga1 mutant controlling mitochondrial morphology. I was just curious if you um, looked at the morphology in those mutants. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So actually, we mainly look at uh, lysosomal morphology change. We find uh, interesting change there. But you know, sometimes um, I think the the postdoc just out of curiosity also um, put some metal tracker uh, there, and uh, we also see there is a dynamic change. Uh, but the interesting thing is in the gut and then, then the hyperdermal cells, um, it seems like it's going different direction. 
So we are still trying to understand, you know, um, how and uh, yeah, but it, I think that's definitely interesting. Quite, we do see change, uh, but whether or not that related to mTOR or maybe there are another mechanism, we don't know. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. I think Daniel ask. Uh, I can read it out to you too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So Daniel says, uh, wonderful talk. Do you think the microbiome plays a major role in determining variation in health span or lifespan in natural populations? And given the huge variation among individuals, do you think we can identify the mechanisms? Yeah, that's a tough question. And then um, I, I think I, I kind of like, you know, always think about this question. Um, you know, as a normal like person and then, uh, you know, kind of following those research also as a scientist um, who is interested in this area. So as a scientist, I'm always optimistic, you know, I know that the, the, the question is tough and um, um, we, 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 you know, maybe with improvement of technology and uh, we can answer this question. Uh, but if like, as a, like people, you know, sometimes talk, think about, you know, how can I apply those to my daily life and, you know, to guide uh, my um, lifestyle. I always feel maybe we are too far away to know the mechanism. Um, but, you know, I, I, I agree the, the microbiome, you know, in C. elegans, it's very simple. We can really manipulate uh, everything in a very, very fine-tuned manner. Um, but in, in, in human, yeah, it's, it's very complex and it's very dynamic. I think um, not only the, I think like phylogenetic changes, I think, you know, the, the, the daily um, changes in response to diet, uh, response to even the mood, I think, you know, because they are life um, organisms, they are, you know, life cells, they are, they, they are changing, they are, activities and dynamics they, and then they may generate different things and impact us um, but I don't know yeah so but I think that make it fascinating question thanks Ming thank you I had a uh, question so um, you mentioned earlier on in the seminar that a switch to, um, I guess I would say reliance on lipid metabolism is thought to promote longevity. Um, have you, and through um, retrograde signaling or crosstalk between these different organelles, given the role of glucose metabolism in many age-related diseases, have you looked at um, the effects of heavy um, reliance on glycolysis, um, on crosstalk, and on longevity in any of these organisms? Oh, I, I guess the question you have is, that can we, do we have a model to um, shift the balance to another end, right? So, and see um, whether we can see the opposite effect. Is that what like yes. for, okay mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so we um, didn't work uh, in this area but their other colleagues in the field did very interesting um, uh, studies and find uh, when you increase you know, like under high glucose condition uh, the worm live shorter um, so um, you know and then I we um, did some like when we developed some technology so i didn't talk about our technology developmental uh, part today but we're also working on uh, technology development to do kind of metabolic um profiling you know through imaging so through that study and then to look at the high glucose um worms that are short-lived uh, we found actually they change their lipid metabolism as well uh, so i think my Short answer, I think these two things are really tied together. Um, sometimes, you know, you feel you pu um, push to high glucose and then to push the glycolysis, but you're also changing uh, the lipid metabolism, you know, not necessarily changing lipolysis, 
but you know you, you are changing the composition of a lipid, um, then you see um, like the more detrimental effect on the um, on the organism. You know, shorten their lifespan. But that's really due to the glycolysis, or it's actually due to the consequence of a uh, lipid metabolism change. I, I don't know whether I make myself clear here or not. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Thank you. Yeah, but I think also, I think recently I, I saw um, a nature, I think it's a nature medicine paper. Um, they actually in human, right, doing this uh, low fat or low carb uh, studies and try to, they look like, they, I think they look at um, body weight and, uh, you know, metabolic thing. But I think it, it will be interesting to run some long-term studies to look at some of the aging related uh, parameters. We, we are doing a lot in um, all, like model systems, but I sometimes feel, um, you know, it's, um, how to say, for example, if you're working with fruit flies, right, they, they don't use the lipid metabolites that much. So actually most of the time they use carb. Um, for C. elegans, actually, I think they're more tolerant to um, lipid and proteins, um, but they are low actually in general in sugar. Um, so I think you know different organisms have a basal line of their metabolism, and sometimes the thing we study here, I think, they are interesting for understanding the biology and then understanding the fundamental metabolic mechanisms. But if we think about like you know um, future application uh, in humans, uh, I think we we need to um, consider. Um, the specificity of the metabolic features in different organisms and how we manipulate them. Thanks so much. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Wong? Okay, well, thank you so much again for thank joining you. us and for yeah. the wonderful seminar. Thank you. All right, see you all. See ya, yeah, thank you.